Did you know that March is National Nutrition Month? Created by the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, an annual nutrition education and information campaign is celebrated to focus on the importance of making informed food choices and develop sound eating and physical activity habits. This year, the theme is Beyond the Table. According to eatright.org, this theme addresses the farm-to-fork aspect of nutrition, from food production and distribution to navigating grocery stores and farmers markets. Go to eatright.org forward slash national dash nutrition dash month to learn more about how you can start creating healthier food habits today. And since it is National Nutrition Month, I thought I'd rewind back to an eye-opening conversation all about food security and nutrition when it comes to populations in low-resource settings all around the world. Hope you enjoy. When it comes to global health, I think that nutrition seems to take a back seat. The topic seems so incredibly underrated, but with the right nutrition habits, foods, and sourcing, the story where a community with children suffering from wasting, stunted growth, and development can drastically be changed. According to the 2022 edition of the State of Food Security and Nutrition in the World, An estimated 45 million children under five years of age suffer from wasting, a topic we'll get into during this episode. 149 million children have stunted growth and development due to a chronic lack of nutritious foods in their diets, while 39 million are affected by being overweight. What if I told you that implementing the tiniest change in a child's diet can dramatically improve their immunity, their ability to recover from diseases, and prevent new diseases from occurring. This is exactly what our guest today, Dr. Laura Iannotti, aims to achieve with her team in the E3 Nutrition Lab at the Brown School at Washington University. Here's a little bit about Dr. Iannotti before we jump in. Dr. Laura Iannotti is a professor in public health at the Brown School at Washington University in St. Louis, Missouri. She's a founding director of the E3 Nutrition Lab, a transdisciplinary research lab working to identify nutrition solutions globally that embrace the principles of the three E's, equity, evolution, and environmental sustainability. She has expertise in maternal and young child nutrition and nutrient deficiencies related to poverty and infectious diseases. Dr. Iannotti leads projects in Haiti, Ecuador, Kenya, and Madagascar, where she collaborates with local partners to test innovative approaches using animal source foods to improve child growth and brain development. Dr. Iannotti received her MA in Foreign Affairs from University of Virginia and PhD in International Nutrition from the Johns Hopkins University Bloomberg School of Public Health. My name is Hethel Bauman, and this is The Global Health Pursuit. Hi, Laura. How are you? I'm well. How are you? I'm doing so good. This is going to be such a good conversation. I think nutrition is something that we often put on the back burner when we talk about global health. And so this is going to be, I think, a refreshing conversation and something that I'll definitely learn a lot just by speaking with you. So Laura, first questions first. Tell us a little bit about your background and your story. Sure. So I'm a professor at the Brown School at Washington University in St. Louis in public health, and I have been working on nutrition for maybe three decades, a long time. So before academia, I was working for 10 years in program work. So for USAID, for the UN, Food and Agriculture Organization, and for different nutrition projects. But I have probably from, you know, day one been interested in hunger, food insecurity, and malnutrition for quite some time. Where did that spark come from? When I was little, I remember seeing images of um, a pretty severe Ethiopian famine. And I remember that being one of the motivating factors 
And then I think it's probably also because I'm Italian and we like to feed people. We like to feed people very good foods. <laughs> I mm-hmm, I joke mm-hmm. about that, but I do think there is there's something innate about you know why I'm working on nutrition. I think the the third reason came a little bit later, and that's because I'm a mother. I'm a mother of three, and I remember very early on in their lives that sort of instinct to want to take care of and feed well my children. So when I work on malnutrition in young children, in part, it's for the sake of the mother's well-being too. Yeah, that that's so important. You said that. I think another thing that you touched on was how culture also impacts the type of food that we eat too. That's huge. I mean, in Indian culture, you know, food is everything for us as well. It is, in fact. In fact. And there's so many, as you, as you were saying earlier, there's so many different social determinants of these public health problems and nutrition is certainly one of them. So it's culture, it's economics, it's agriculture. There's just, it's a wide array of of determinants that we have to pay attention to. And culture is high on that list. Culture is so high. You said that you worked for USAID. What made you switch into the world of academia? Yeah, so I worked for, it was called the Linkages Project at the time, and and actually it still exists today, but in different forms and names. So today it's called Advancing Nutrition, and essentially these are USAID bilateral sort of technical agencies that provide high-level support in nutrition around the world to very low-resource settings. Mm -hmm. And I enjoyed this very much. The people that I worked with, I still collaborate with today. My students still work with them. It's pretty remarkable. But at the time, I remember feeling I had a master's degree, but I didn't have a PhD. And I remember wanting to be even more legitimate in my nutrition expertise. (laughs) So I went back to school to deepen my understanding of nutrition not entirely expecting to go into academia. I intended actually to go back and and do work in the field and do work for UN agencies with that higher level technical expertise. But then I sort of fell in love Mm -hmm. with academia and stayed in research and teaching. What does your day-to-day look like, you know, now? Because you did say that you used to work in the field and now you work in academia. So what does that look like today? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think it's important to sort of just back up and also describe public health research and applied research in particular. Mm. So I'm in that sort of domain of of community-based research, and that means that I still get to do field work. My countries where I'm working, which include Haiti, Ecuador, Kenya, and Madagascar, each of those countries actually have field teams fantastic field teams who come from the communities, come from universities in each of those countries. And they run the show in the field, but periodically I get to go and help with training or help with sort of technical inputs into the various research projects. And what we work on also mirrors some of that early program work that I did, which is we try to develop interventions that are going to address these problems of malnutrition. So we develop those interventions based on formative research, and then we test them, and we see if they are effective for improving child growth, for example. And if they are effective, then they can be scaled up by other organizations, not academia, but mm-hmm. other organizations. And organizations such as like NGOs Correct. or... Correct. You use the term formative research. What does that mean? Yeah. So formative research is a critical phase when you're developing an intervention, that's when you go to these communities, you do exactly what you mentioned earlier, which is figure out what is the culture around the foods that you're interested in and the nutrition problems. What is the background nutritional status of that community? You know, what can people afford? What foods are already there in the diet? Mm -hmm. So as an example, we did a study called La Lune in Ecuador and before we, we tested the intervention, which was one egg per day for six months in, in early childhood, we did formative research to see, okay, does this indigenous community already value eggs? 
And the answer was yes. Mm. Do they have chickens? Mm. Yes. Um, do they already appreciate the nutritional value of these foods? And what was their background nutrition status? And all of those mm. things pointed to the trial that we eventually conducted and, in fact, had pretty good results from that trial. So I want to talk about some statistics. One of the papers that you sent me said an estimated 45 million children under five years of age suffer from wasting. What is wasting? Yes. So there are three different forms of malnutrition in childhood that we focus on. Most of my work actually focuses on stunted growth, which is Mm -hmm. more of a measure of chronic malnutrition. When people don't have access to high quality foods, they're eating, for example, too many staple foods, carbohydrates, um, without a diverse set of foods. And they have what's called micronutrient deficiencies, and this leads to stunted growth and development. Okay. Wasting is a measure that we often use for acute malnutrition. And that is what might occur in an emergency or a humanitarian crisis where you have a sudden loss of weight. So the the indicator itself Mm -hmm. is weight for height. And that then gives you this, you know, this drop in your Z-score for weight for age. And that that pushes you into wasting. It's what you would see in a famine situation or, like I said, an emergency crisis. So this is kind of what we saw during the COVID pandemic. We saw increases in both stunting and wasting, unfortunately. Yeah, unfortunately. People... People fell into economic crisis, right. so it wasn't it wasn't so much the infection itself, but it was the economic crisis and access to foods. So, what are you seeing when you first go into a new community? Let's say you're in Kenya, right? You came into this community. What do you see before, or what do you what are you assessing outside of the culture and what they appreciate before you actually? Bring in an intervention. Yes. So Kenya is a, is a really good example. I'm glad you asked that question. We had a trial called Samaki Salama, which is secure fish in, in Kiswahili. And basically, we were trying to encourage small fishers, fishing households. So, you know, small scale fishing enterprises um, along the coast to keep some of their fish catch and give them to young children. Mm. Now, why did we do that? We did that because as you, as you pose the question, we went and we did the formative research along the coast in Kenya. And we saw that in these small fishing households, children were very malnourished. So they were experiencing both stunting and wasting. They did not have very much fish in their diets. So the households were primarily selling the fish for income so that they would buy more maize, which could feed more mouths, but it wasn't good nourishment for the young children. So it was almost like the maize was the cheaper route to go. Correct. For them to... Yes, correct. Hey there, I hope you're enjoying this episode. And if you are... Would you do me a tiny favor? Show me some love by doing one or more of these three things. A, click the support this podcast link in the description to donate a few dollars toward the production of this podcast. My dream is to do this full time and your support would mean the world. B, you can write me a review on Apple Podcasts and or rate me on Spotify to give me a boost in the algorithm. Or C, Share this episode with someone who would love it just as much as you do. I truly and deeply appreciate you. Let's get back to the episode. But then the cool part of this project, I think, was that it it combined with an objective to also protect marine ecosystem health. So we distributed, in addition to this sort of social marketing to encourage fish for young children, we also distributed modified traps for the fishermen. And these traps have a, an opening, a small opening that allows juvenile fish to escape and just keep the adult fish, thereby protecting the ecosystem. 
So fish are allowed to grow to their full maturity. Actually, there was increases in fish biomass, so the yield, so incomes went up. Um, and there were a lot of positive findings, not only for child health and their diets, but also for the marine ecosystem and for the household income. What you're saying is that with those modified traps, when people were using them before they were modified, were they still eating the the less grown, I don't know, the smaller fish? They were mostly selling those. You yeah, selling them. mostly selling them. And we also, you know, we made efforts to encourage consumption of fish from lower trophic levels. Again, this helps the ecosystem in that environment. And it's not to be confused with small fish that have grown to their full size, because those are very right. nutritious, actually. And in lots of parts of the world, we encourage people to eat small fish because it's sustainable from an environmental point of view, but also it's very dense in nutrients as a small fish. It's concentrated in nutrients. But those fish, sardines, herring, those are examples. Those have grown yeah. to their full, full size. So in, in our case, we're talking about larger fish that were just juvenile. And that was harming the ecosystem. When you come into a community like this, are you partnering with another NGO that that kind of works with these communities? Or do you have your own teams that are part of your research lab that live in those communities? Philosophically, I make an effort to, you know, not come into a country with my my lab per se. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. You know, philosophically, <laughs> I have long taken a different approach, which is that mm -hmm. we usually, what we typically do because it's research is we partner with a university from that country. Um, okay. And in this case, in, in Kenya, it's Pwani University and Egerton University. So two universities in Kenya, they identify, you know, faculty members or students who help mm -hmm. with on the research team. And we usually subcontract with those universities to do the, the field work. Now, in terms of dissemination later, and when we want to scale up an intervention, then we reach out to the NGOs. And we certainly partner closely with the Ministry of Health, the Ministry of Fisheries and Wildlife, for example, or Agriculture. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That comes later. Actually, usually early, so they have some ownership in it, but it's with a view that, okay, this research isn't going to just be published in a journal or sit on a shelf, mm. but instead mm -hmm, it's mm -hmm. going to get translated by NGOs or by the government into real practice on, on the ground. Can you talk about some of the projects that have gone to that scale? Yeah, sure. So, so I mentioned earlier the Laloon project, which was the one egg per day uh, for six months in Ecuador. And there, we had a large effect on child growth. So we reduced mm -hmm. stunting by 47%, and we increased. Oh, wow, that's it's huge. huge. It was huge. Wow. And um, the government of, of Ecuador, so the Ministry of Health, had been involved from the beginning. They had a policy in place that said introduce eggs at 12 months mm. because of concerns over cholesterol and allergies. They gave mm -hmm. us permission to intervene early at six months. And then with the results of the study, they changed the recommendation. So that's going to have big impacts in terms of, you know, sort of dietary guidelines and recommendations in the country. I was just thinking about this. Have you seen any sort of pushback from any of the families from this, these changes? Pushback in terms of? In terms of, oh, this is a little bit different from what we have been used to doing. Like, for example, like the maize example, right? Yeah. It's like, we, we want to save money. So we're going to go and buy maize instead. But now you're telling me that you want us to feed our kids these fish. Oh yeah. I mean, absolutely. No human makes these gigantic changes easily. Right. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so right. you have to you have to think on a sort of incremental level and you have to start with small changes that can lead to bigger behavior change later. So absolutely maize is a is an excellent example where you know that is culturally it's not food if you don't have maize on your plate. 
or mm. in it's like rice exactly. in the Asian exactly. country. Exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's mm-hmm. not a meal if you don't have rice, or it's not a meal if you don't have. But what you can do is you can just encourage, well, let's reduce it a little bit. Let's increase the fish and just start sort of incrementally with those messages. Mm. And what we have found is that in most cases, probably 99% of cases, parents want to do the very best for their children. Right. So if, if we're encouraging diet diversity or fish, and this is in fact what we saw in Kenya, the results of our study shows that now they're feeding their children fish. So behavior was changed with that sort of messaging and encouragement. Did you see any changes in the health of these children in regards to neglected tropical diseases or infectious diseases? Those examples, when you had put in these interventions? Mm -hmm. Another great question. So yeah, nutrition is very closely connected to diarrheal disease and to enteric Mm -hmm. infection, infection in the gut. So if we don't simultaneously address diarrhea and water sanitation and hygiene conditions in countries, then we're missing a huge part of the nutrition puzzle. Now that said, there are also, we also measure and encourage practices to reduce respiratory infection, malaria, fever, hookworm, Mm -hmm. you mentioned NTD. So all of those, those infectious diseases correlate and relate to nutrition. And to answer your question, one of our really cool findings in Kenya actually was a reduction in diarrhea and in fever. So these kids were really sick to begin with, Mm-hmm. And we're seeing this this nice effect. Nutrition has an impact on a child's ability to recover from a disease. So they typically, it, tip, it, it can help with sort of preventing infection to begin with, but what it really helps with is recovery. So the child will get diarrhea, but they can, they, they get over it quicker. Might be a... An interesting correlation with the immune system, Correct. too. Correct. So it's usually, if one example, and this may be too technical, you can, you can tell me. <laughs> one example is zinc, the nutrient zinc, which is found mm-hmm. in fish and in other animal source foods, is important right. for, the, for T cells. And T cells in the immune system are what we need for adaptive immunity or for, you know, memory immunity is what, what it's called. Oh, that's so cool how just putting a different diet can change yes. so many other things. So, Laura, what are what are some other projects and places that you're hoping to work with in the future? Are you dabbling in on like other countries? Yeah, so we I've just actually returned from Madagascar and Madagascar we're working on it's actually a conservation effort for forests, protected forests in the communities where we're working. And this is a collaboration with the Missouri Botanical Garden. And what we're doing is we're looking at how wild foods, so wild plant foods, and also wild animal foods from the river are contributing to child nutrition and how they might be also among the plants that are protected. So during hunger season, families go to the forest because they're waiting to harvest their crops. So they go to the forest to find wild foods to survive, basically. What we have found is that, thankfully, the plants that they're harvesting from the forest are not protected. So they tend to be tubers and other greens, and they're actually helping with child malnutrition. So this, this going back to the beginning of our conversation, was the formative research we've mm-hmm, just completed. Mm-hmm. And now we're working on sort of phase two, which is developing an intervention that can help the community in terms of nutrition while maintaining the conservation objective. You said a term that was new to me. You said hunger season. Yeah. What is that? That usually occurs and it's become quite erratic with climate change, unfortunately. But hunger season usually coincides with planting and growing. So you're waiting, your, your foods are, your, your crops are, you can't eat them yet. 
So it's a, it's a hunger season. You don't, if you're, if you are existing on what we call subsistence food production, which means you don't go to a market to buy foods or a grocery store, but you have to grow your own foods or raise them with livestock. If you're entirely dependent on that, then there is much more likely to be this hunger season that occurs while you're waiting to to harvest crops. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. It's like a waiting period. Yes. So then they have to look elsewhere for their food. Exactly. Exactly. And it can wow. be a hardship for people. Yeah, I can imagine. Wow. Well, Laura, thank you so much for this conversation. I learned so much. This was so good. I'm glad. It's an important issue and thank you for thank you for covering it as a story. I appreciate that. Yeah, of course. As as we mentioned, like global health is not just healthcare, you know, it's so many more disciplines outside of that. And so that's really the focus of this podcast, you know, just trying to cover as many disciplines as possible because it's really not one straight answer. Yes. Thank you for listening to this episode. If you'd like to learn more about today's topic and guest, head over to the show notes linked in the description of this episode. There, you can get access to resources, links, and ways you can get involved in the pursuit for global health. And if you loved this episode, don't forget to write me a review on Apple Podcasts and rate the podcast on Spotify. It helps me get in front of more people just like you and continues to elevate the causes we are so passionate about. I'll see you in the next one.